Thomas Sabat is our, is our next speaker, or the first speaker of the day, actually. And um, he's the chief operating officer at Vatical, creators of TypeDB and TypeQL. He works closely with their open source and enterprise users who use TypeDB to build applications in a wide number of industries, including financial services, life sciences, cybersecurity, and supply chain management. He's the graduate from uh, the University of Cambridge and spent the last eight years founding and building businesses in the technology industry. And one thing that will be very interesting to you is that everything he'll be showing off today is open source. So when you can, if you're interested, you can go ahead and uh, check out these things for yourself. Tomas, welcome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry for the delay and everything, but we did get it working. Uh, just when, when you're doing these things, the adapters apparently can be a little bit confusing. So uh, thank you for borrowing uh, yours. So you save the day. So thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, I've, I'm, I'm, we're based in London, so I had the pleasure of coming to Bratislava actually after, the first time after five years. I, I once transited here, so it's, it's really nice to be here. Um, and I want to present to you a particular open source project that um, has been built by the community. I've also been a main author of it. But I, I think just to preface a little bit on who we are as a company. So we're Vatical, we're the creators and uh, builders of TypeDB, which is a database software that is used across different industries. So we work with, with um, life science companies, supply chain companies, e-commerce companies, um, and also cybersecurity, defense intelligence, especially in the last couple of months, that's been quite an interesting um, development, especially with government and, and private contractors. And so this project is a little bit in that light. So um, it's aimed at people without a cybersecurity background. If you're interested to learn a little bit about the space specifically when it comes to data specifications, th this particular project that I want to sh share is open source. Uh, it's basically, um, uh, there's, a, there's a data standard called STIX, which, does anyone, is anyone familiar with STIX at all? That's what I'm expecting. It's, it's actually, it's, it's a very niche um, data standard. It's a very, very important data specification, how data is described within the cyber threat intelligence space and originally developed by Homeland Security. And that's sort of what I want to talk about today, how we represent that in TypeDB. The, the repo itself is effectively consists of a particular data set, which is the MITRE attack data set, which is a collection of vulnerabilities, tactics, techniques that, that adversaries use to infiltrate um, you know, systems. And that data set is open source, and so we can use that to, to ingest that into our, uh, into our database. But then we use the stick specification to describe that data, because there's different ways of how the MITRE attack data set is provided. And then we use, of course, TypeDB as the, the main database. Everything is in Python, all the loader loading scripts, that's, that's all been built in Python. Uh, and you can check that out for yourself. But before, before we look at to the, some of the design decisions of the, the, the model, I just want to do a quick demo about how actually this, once you've got it running on your systems, what that, how that actually looks in practice. So this here, this is what we call TypeDB Studio. And TypeDB Studio is, is effectively our IDE to work with TypeDB. So you can write your schemas, you can write your schemas, uh, query for data, and also visualize data. Can everyone see this or should we dim the lights a little bit? Should we dim the lights or not? No? Okay. So, <laughs> so basically, um, the, if you clone the repo, uh, you, you, you load the data, you can run this query for yourself. So um, this is our language, TypeQL. So we, we invented this language. You can think of it as a replacement of SQL. And I'm happy to speak more on TypeDB later if, if you want, but this talk is more specifically on the cybersecurity side of things. But we can run this query, which is basically asking for, give me a course of action, which we assign to this variable course. This course of action has a name called restrict file and directory permissions. And, it's, and the second entity that we're looking for is an intrusion set, which has a name called black tech. And then basically what we're asking is give me, give me a mitigation relation between the course of action and the intrusion set. So we're, we're basically asking that there's a particular course of action with, which can mitigate against a particular intrusion set, in this case, black tech. So if we run the query, uh, which, are, which is currently run, but we run it just again, 
and we see that the result is what we see below. So here it's visualized as a graph. We can also get the output, of course, as a log or, uh, or in the console, or if you're talking with a client API, whether it's in Python, Java, Node.js, whatever, you can also push it into your application. Um, and the result is basically showing us that indeed this course of action, which is called restrict file and directory permissions, seems to mitigate against this particular intrusion set. Now, that's, that's interesting insofar as we now know that there's a relation between the two. But we may actually wanna know more. We wanna find out why is this, how, where does this relation come from? Because one of the, one of the core tenets that we built in TypeDB is that we put an inference engine in the database. So we can infer new information that effectively is in there through logical deduction based on automated reasoning or symbolic AI principles. And this particular relation here means that it's, it's inferred. It, it says so here in the type, that, but that's just because that's how we define the type. This could have easily been whatever label you give it. And I know it's inferred because I've done this demo before. Uh, but also, you can qu programmatically qu query it to ask if it's inferred. But the cool thing about it, because it's inferred, we can double click on it and we get an explanation why that particular inference happened. So we see that there's a particular attack pattern that seems to be actually, that, that, that's the actual connection between the course of action and the attack pattern. And this is some sort of DLL side loading, which is using this intrusion set. Right, so even though we're not, this course of action isn't directly connected to that intrusion set, we can still infer some sort of relation just purely based on transitivity of something using something. Therefore, the first thing is should be connected to the other because it's indirectly connected. But there's actually another explanation for this relation. And so if I double click again here, we see that this attack, that there's actually another attack pattern that's also connected to that course of action. As a side note, by the way, um, we use the entity relationship diagram notation here to describe in diamonds relations in squares, entities, and in circles, attributes. But we see here that this course of action is also mitigating against this attack pattern, which seems to be using this intrusion set. But, and this is where it gets really cool, because this usage relationship is actually also inferred. So we've got an inference, another inference. And so if I double click here again, we see that the actual underlying persisted data set that we ingested from MITRE originally shows us that this course of action actually mitigates against this attack pattern, which in turn is using this malware, this type of malware, which then is using this intrusion set. Anyway, the point of this is to show that uh, basically I'm, I'm hopefully not full of shit and that there's you know, something that you can show. Um, but the query that we saw at the, at the, at the bottom, at, at the top there, that's a fairly simple query at first glance. But if we zoom out a little bit, this is, this is starting to already get a fairly, to show a fairly complex set of relationships. And if you're, if you, if you're trying to effectively write a query that tries to interpret all the different potential query paths in the query, well, you're, you're gonna have a much more complex query at your hands. So in effect, what you're doing is you're pushing down application layer logic into your, into your database. That's sort of what we're encoding. We're encoding knowledge in the database. So, and because the reasoning happens across the database, you're not loading something into memory and then reasoning over it. You're doing at the database level over persisted, over persisted data. Uh, and by the way, so this studio, uh, which is the whole visualization, that's also open source. If you did want to contribute on it, or if you did find a fun bugs, please do and let us know um, uh, on our Discord server. The database itself that runs this is also open source, as, as I mentioned. But this is sort of a standalone application um, that, type, that talks to TypeDB. Effectively, what I'm saying that if you want to build some sort of visualization like this, you can actually, and some people have. If you're, if you need something specific to your, to your domain. Now let's go back to the data because I think, this is, I think this is really, really cool. So, so STIX, which actually stands for Structured Threat Information Expression, effectively describes graph-shaped data in the form in, in JSONs, which is, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think it's a pain in the ass 
um, to read. Effectively, because you've got they, they describe they describe these objects. For example, here this intrusion set, which is what we saw just now. Um, these relations like uses, and this is a malware. So this JSON here simply describes this intrusion set uses this malware, which is what we saw just now in the in the in the demo. And so you've got this object here, this intrusion set, this malware, and this uses relation. But this is where it gets really interesting because the Styx model actually uses a lot of embedded relationships. For example, here, this uses relationships as they're created by ref, which refers to another entity. So we've got relations that refer to other relations, and we'll see why that's pretty cool to model in, in TypeDB. But in terms of Styx itself, um, Styx is a very fun specification. Uh, you can download it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a massive specification, and the technical committee at Oasis that built it, again, is, right now it's maintained by, by an open source consortium with European agencies and, and, and American agencies primarily, uh, but it's a, it's a massive, massive document with, uh, I mean, the PDF itself, I, I look at the HTML, so it's just like the scrolling takes you like five minutes probably if you were to manually scroll, scroll down. And it's a very impressive piece of work, but basically the way it's structured in, in separate chapters, and for, for example, chapter four describes so-called domain objects, which are things like intrusion sets. Another domain object is a malware. And so it describes uh, the attributes, for example, that, that should be the properties that should be uh, allowed for intrusion set. And the, the in, but the, the really interesting thing, and the reason particularly why we've seen a lot of adoption um, of TypeDB in particular, and I haven't really spoken much about TypeDB yet, is because the Styx model is very hierarchical. And one of the principles that we've implemented when we build a database, when we build a software, uh, TypeDB is, is to very much use OOP type principle. So type inheritance is it's just a first class principle in TypeDB. So when you're modeling things like domain objects, which effectively means that you've got one type of domain object that has a lot of subtypes. There's, a, there's roughly around, I think, 18 different domain objects. With, uh, with some properties that are shared, as you can see, required common properties, optional common properties, and then specific properties that are just for the intrusion set. So the, the really cool thing, and this is hopefully, again, I'm guessing, is anyone familiar with TypeDB actually at all? Good, so something to share at least. Um, so we define first a domain object here, which basically declares an entity so the, the language on the right, that's our modeling language. If you think of SQL when you're declaring your tables, same thing effectively. But instead of tables, here we're defining entities and relations and attributes natively without effectively enforcing a tabular structure on our, on our data or going down to a third normal form. So here we're defining a Styx domain object. That's a subtype of, a, of another parent again, which is a Styx core object. There are specific at attributes attached to a Styx domain object. And this is where it gets really, really cool, is that we can then define a subtype, which is the intrusion set, which inherits all of the properties and the roles and the attributes that its parent has. In this case, the, uh, the, the, the created modified, so we don't have to redeclare really it. Also, if you're now querying for give me all st domain, uh, Styx domain objects, you're gonna also get all the intrusion sets without having to explicitly declare for those subtypes. Now the hierarchy is very, it's quite complex, but effectively it looks like this, just to hopefully get you as excited as, as we are about this model. Um, so everything starts with, starts with a domain, a Styx object, then there's Styx core objects, Styx meta objects, Styx core objects, and Styx meta objects get categorized into yet more different types. We saw the Styx domain objects that you see here on the, on the far left, those get categorized into, into a into bunch of other subtypes, and then uh, TLP markings get different types of markings, which is a particular way to mark data. Um, I won't get into what this all means. The point being is that for this type of data, the, um, the complexity is just enormous. And this sort of type hierarchy says, particularly what well, the organizations that we work with is just inherent in the data. Even though you may not consider it as such, especially if you're used to using tra traditional database software like SQL or, or even graph databases. So 
Now, the, the beauty of, you know, when we started the company seven years ago is we wanted to build a language that just made it easy and elegant to model this type of data. So, you know, th this type of complexity, you can, just with one keyword, sub, we can simply subtype all of these things. And basically everything that I showed before, and I won't go into the details here, but, but, but we've really tried to craft the language. Hopefully you'll see that as you're using it as, as elegant as possible. So the keywords like sub, trying to keep them as to, to three characters long so that, if, so that when you're reading the language, it just makes sense to you. I mean, I, we, we joke around that the, the, the type of technology that we want to build is like, if you think of the 70s when you had do-it-yourself computers before the before you know computer revolution happened, where you had to you know design your your motherboard, your CPU, put everything together, which is really cool, you know, for for, for you know for, for a lot of people out there. Um, but then came the Macintosh, which basically put everything together. Your you couldn't choose your CPU or your motherboard anymore, but now your grandmother could use your computer, or at least your mother. And so we're trying to do the same with this type of technologies where to build something that inherently works well as a coherent system that allows you to work with this type of data. Now going back to, to, to sticks, there's, there's some really cool, cool type of data that we can model. So for example, a, a, so a threat actor entity, uh, which has an embedded relation here um, as another embedded relation, and then there's an indication relation that again has another embedded relation. One of the one of the tenets of the way we build the language is to make relations able to refer to other relations, which is something that we call nested relations. So a nested relation is basically the ability to to have a relation refer to another relation. So here we've got an indication between uh, an indicator and a threat actor, where effectively we're saying that. We want to now categorize that indication as a TLP red through a, a relation of type object marking. So we can directly create that relation and refer to that other relation with, that, with little, little effort. I won't go into the, the syntax in TypeQL, um, or maybe I will. So the, the main thing that I want to just sort of highlight here is that this, this here, this line here, if you can see my mouse, this here is now assigning this variable i and d to this particular relation between this indicator and this threat actor, which creates that relation. But now because we've assigned this variable, we can now put this variable into this other relation at the bottom. And in case it wasn't clear, um, these we're saying that this indicator relation here plays the role of marked in an object marking relation. And then we've got a TLP that plays the role of marking in a object marking relation. And so the ability to use roles allows us to contextualize how a particular thing plays a role in a, in a relation. And then, we, and then another uh, really important fundamental concept, modeling concept for, for, for TypeDB is the ability to represent hyperrelations. Relations in TypeDB, if you're a little bit familiar with graph theory, uh, usually you're working with binary relations. TypeDB uses hyperrelations, which effectively, instead of thinking of a relation as a pair of two things, you, you think of them as a, as a set of things. So you can have n number of things in one relation. And one example of those is this ternary relation we can, where we can represent three things natively in one relation. And, and not having to reify or, or sort of impose some sort of unnatural data structure on the, on the, on the model, we can, this network source, net, network traffic source, we can directly model natively with an IPv4 network traffic and an artifact that play different roles here. So for the artifact here plays the role of payload in the context of a network traffic source relation. And, and um, to go back to the, to, the, to the demo that we showed earlier, just to give you a little bit of context of how that's actually built, sort of the, 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 how the inference engine Gets his, gets his insights because you have to model your data. You're effectively modeling the knowledge in the right way in order to create those insights. And so the, the query that we, that we saw earlier where we've got this course of action between, and between this course of action and this intrusion set, which you know, infers into, into this, that first explanation 
that explains this relation between the intrusions and, and the course of action is this explanation, which is based on something that we call a rule. So a rule is part of our schema in TypeDB that allows us to, to, to encapsulate some sort of modular logic. And that's always going to be deterministic. So this is not machine learning type of inference. This is automated reasoning type of inference where we can say that if there's a set of conditions in the database that's true, so if there's a course of action that's mitigating for this sticks domain object, and that can be any of the subtypes of those SDOs, so without having to explicitly specify every single subtype, um, and if any of those SDOs is being used by this intrusion set, then we want to create a relation between the course of action and the intrusion set. And so now, every time you query for the database, even, even if you've got terabytes and terabytes of data, you can make that inference quite easy, effectively without having to know that this rule even exists just by querying for this inferred mitigation. And one rule doesn't look very impressive, but if you've got a lot of data, and I'm talking you know, trillions, billions of instances of data, and you've got just with a few dozen rules, you can almost exponentially start to grow the number of queries that you can answer. And usually when we work with organizations, and that's both academics to large governments, the, a lot of this is application layer logic that goes into the database. The complex queries, um, logic, pseudo reasoning engines in the application that now gets pushed down into the database in a very simple way. Now the second, in the second explanation that we saw earlier, this relation, this uses relation right here, is which, which is because this intrusion set uh, is using is used by this malware, which is being used by this attack pattern, is a is is down to this very simple relation, uh, which is a, a simple transitive relation. If something is using something, and if that other something is using yet another thing, we want to infer that the first thing is inferring is using that other thing. And so that scales exponentially uh, the more data you have, of course. So to summarize, because I'm almost out of time, some of the reasons why um, we've seen TypeDB being used in the, especially in the, in the intelligence space, which is sort of what this talk is about, is one, because of the expressivity, so the ability to model very complex data as natively as possible. So without enforcing some sort of unnatural data structure on it, which is effectively, you think about it as a tabular structure, that the world doesn't really work in tables if we think of it as humans. And the second is the logical inference, so the ability to infer new insights from the, from the database with very little effort. So with that, um, again, this, everything that I showed today is, is available on this, uh, on this repo. If you search for typedb-cti, you'll be able to find it. Um, it's in our TypeDB OSI organization. We've got a bunch of OSI projects for, um, for our community. And also, if, if you do want to join our community, um, there's people working in all sorts of applications, not just in, in cybersecurity. This is quite a, quite a niche application. Um, I was actually surprised they accepted this talk for this conference, because it's actually very specific. Within cybersecurity, CTI is quite a niche field, but it's, it's, it's growing a lot, um, especially because, well, because of the security landscape since, uh, since uh, well, as you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so it's, it's something that's really, really important, and we're very fortunate to be able to contribute in our, uh, in our small way, working with both private and, and public organizations. So join our Discord if you're interested to connect with us. Uh, you can find me on there. Uh, I realize I don't have the link here, but if you go to vatical.com slash Discord, you should be able to find us. So, and I see... Um, so yeah, so I'll leave it at that. If there's any questions, happy to, to answer. And I'm, I'm, I'm hanging around for today here in Bratislava. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. And um, we're happy to, to, to feature, to, kind of like to, to address what you, what you mentioned in, uh, at the end, uh, some very general, um, generally interesting talks as well as more niche talks. Um, so uh, this year, just like every year, uh, we had a lot more applications for talks than we were able to, to accept. But try to keep this interesting and fresh and to show that Python is, is used in many different domains and uh, that there are very interesting use cases. Uh, the first question uh, that we have is, um, it kind of, kind of touches on what, what, what you mentioned. You did a, one very specific uh, showcase uh, in the security domain. 
And the question is, this looks intriguing. Uh, who is the target group of, of the software, presumably TypeDB? And what are some of your favorite use cases? So this was one. Are there any other use cases for TypeDB? So, so anything that works with uh, complex data. So if you, th if you think of complex data, if you, or if you think of general, data in general, you've got, let's say on the one hand side, you've got time, time series data. That's just like unconnected data, a lot of data timestamps, boom, 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 boom. And then on the other hand, you've got highly, highly interconnected data with a lot of relations, a lot of types that need to be modeled. Think of the molecular structure of our bodies. That's very, very typed. You want to accurately represent that in a database. So that's the high level use case. Uh, specifically, that means uh, we work a lot with pharma. So uh, drug discovery type of applications, supply chain management systems as well. Think of a supply chain, all the different vendors, all the different chains and, and all of that. E-commerce, uh, security, of course, um, finance. Space, uh, European, we work with the European Space Agency as well. Actually, in Amsterdam, we had, a, we had an event there two weeks ago where they presented uh, an NLU application with TypeDB. Um, crypto, of course, um, and, and anything really that works with complex data. Some, someone once decompiled the source code of one of the Apollo moon landing sessions, represented it in TypeDB, and then used the reasoning engine to represent some of the most commonly known bugs from DARPA and use that as a sort of a source code verification system, sort of. And that was really cool, I thought. If you were to elaborate on that a little bit, so when we talk about types, uh, so out of any of these use cases, what would be example of like, what types are you talking about? Like what specifically is that? Yeah, so if you think of, if you, if you saw the, um, let me just pull this up real quick again. So if you, if you consider this model right here, uh, actually let me show this one here. When we're describing this type of data, we're, we're, we're we're explicitly typing all of these types, right? So this works as schema. This works firstly for safety reasons, so that, only, so that you can only insert this type of data into the database, nothing else, right? So this is going back to schema, but it's very easy to change the schema, by the way. It's not like you have to do some painful migration if you change the schema. But so now you, you're, you can define, of course, that only TLP ambers can have a certain set of attributes Sticks objects can only have a certain set of objects because that's how you think of the world. And let's say this type cannot be connected to that type. So there's a lot of sort of semantics that you want to represent in the database. And that semantic expression is, is what, we're, what we're typing explicitly in the database. Got it. Thank you. Um, the next question would be, was the solution inspired in any way by academic research related to, to the semantic web representing data as ontologies? and storing them as triplets. Excellent, I'm glad someone brought the semantic web up. Um, so we have a lot of love and respect for the semantic web. And however, we did feel that before starting the company that, you know, I, I've written about this quite extensively and you, you'll find some stuff online about this. But basically, if you consider the balance, whenever you're building a new language, whether it's a programming language or a query language, there's this balance between how expressive do you make it and how complex do you, do you make it. And, Smart people have a tendency to make things very complex, by the way. Like, you know, we've worked with very smart people, and, and trust me, it's really hard to make them do simple things. That's why Apple is such a great company, as a side note. But the semantic web, in our view, has just, just a very, very uh, wrong balance between how expressive it is and how simple it is to use. Uh, in fact, it's not simple at all to use. I think anyone can agree on that. Um, that's not to say that it's, that it's very impressive, the work that has been done, but we felt that to build software, real software for the world, the semantic web is just unsatisfactory in having the right balance between being maintainable, being simple to use. And, and it's, it's, you know, depending on the serialization that you're using, the, the, it's, it's difficult to read. So all these factors, when I refer to that, on that analogy between the Mac, the, the, the Macintosh and, and, and today, and before that, that's sort of what I was sort of referring to. Because if you're if you're using the semantic web and you want to have a, you need one, you need one standard for uh, to have safety constraints, one standard to do reasoning, one standard to do the querying, and then there's different implementations of those standards. It gets very convoluted. Doesn't mean that it doesn't work. But you can also you can also build a self-driving car using assembly code. But I don't think many people are doing that. Again, with all due respect to the to the, to the semantic web. How many, oops, uh, just clicked it away. Uh, but the oh. question was, uh, how many, how many uh, objects can you store in TypeDB before performance starts to deteriorate? So actually, we haven't tested the upper limits just yet. As a side note, by the way, uh, TypeDB is written in, in Java right now. We are rewriting it into Rust. 
So if any was into Rust, I think we're going to be the first database in the world that's going to be written in Rust. Um, and if anyone is interested, that, that studio, by the way, is building Compose. Uh, if anyone likes the JetBrains type of work. Um, so the, once we do the rewrite in Rust, we're going to publicly share our benchmarks. And we haven't seen the upper limit of TypeDB yet, so I can't really comment on that. Um, in terms of, I saw Neo4j, is, is, is came up. In terms of performance, right now we're sort of on par with Neo4j. Um, performance has been sort of a new thing that we've, that we've come up with because the, the, the key thing for us has been a lot on focusing on the modeling language. So we will be coming out with, um, with performance benchmarks sort of in the next couple of months, early next year. Um, probably we'll present that at a conference in New York. Uh, so if you want to make a trip to the Big Apple, this is your excuse to ask for, for a ticket from your boss. <laughs> Thank you. And now that you mentioned Neo4j, can you compare TabDB to Neo4j, the graph database? What are the benefits for using TabDB instead of Neo4j? So um, think of a graph database, and so I'm including Neo4j in there and all of our other friends in the space as well, as a lower level abstraction than TypeDB. So we actually built our own graph engine under the hood. So we have our own like, uh, graph traversal engine that works similar to Gremlin, if anyone's familiar with that, that does vertex in, vertex out. We built that ourselves, and on top of that, we built the, the, the type system and the inference engine and all of that. So if you, if you consider Python, how Python compiles into C, think of TypeDB compiling into a graph database. One of our challenges that, you know, when we started the company, we were naive and a bit arrogant, I think, uh, to think that we can create a new category in the database space. That's sort of what we've been doing out of, in our opinion, out of necessity. We believe the world needs it. We believe software engineers need that to work with this type of data. We don't think graph databases work for a lot of reasons that I don't have time to get into, but there is some stuff uh, that we've written about that looks at property graph databases specifically and TypeDB. For instance, there's no inferencing natively in graph databases. Uh, there's no typing. Um, there's no hyper relations natively in, type, in, in graph databases. We, there are friends, but we don't believe that their approach works. That was our last question. A big thank you to Tomas. Thank you so much. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomer. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládať tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc z ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. 
Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc siel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.